Well, I'd certainly like to say I'm delighted to be here. Um, thanks to Alex for inviting me, and I, uh, I'm interested to hear what you have to say. Um, I was curious what you were thinking during um, the kind of extended stretches where Philippe seems to be making the same arguments over and over again that are clearly not going to take hold. Like, it, I mean, there's, it, there's sort of an interesting disconnect in Philippe that he's not, he, he doesn't seem to be hearing what Horst thinks and how he thinks and why he thinks this way. It's like he, he attacks it in such a legalistic sort of way that it, I mean, it's, it's kind of strange to watch. It's a little frustrating at times to watch. And, uh, you know, he keeps trying to get something he's not going to get. Um, he keeps just coming at it from slightly different angles. And he, he's doing it so insistently. So, it, like, what are your thoughts on, on those sequences and how, how, what you were trying to get at? Um, is something about articulating Philippe's frustrations, trying to allow that time to show a certain kind of entrenched mentality? Um, yeah. Uh, so the first thing I would say is that uh, Philippe comes from a very close, uh, and very uh, highly communicative family. And for that reason, the, uh, the area of the film that you're referring to is, is called uh, by his mother-in-law the elder abuse sequences. Um, and uh, that I came under quite a lot of uh, uh, pressure to, uh, to remove those uh, via Philippe's wife, uh, speaking on behalf of her mum. Um, so I'm very, very aware that the language of the film deliberately repeats itself. Yeah. Of course, you must know that that's a directorial gesture rather than anything that Philippe takes responsibility for because simply by virtue of the, the massive amount of footage that there usually is with documentaries relative to what ends up in the final cut. Yeah. It's clearly my choice. I, I don't have to have him saying it more than once, right? I, there's plenty of other things that would have filled out the 90 minutes. So and that's, and that's what I'm asking, just because right. we would have expected a cut. Right. right. So uh, my, reasons, my reasons really are to do with the history and the evolution of the film which began with Philippe's um, conviction that, in the first case, Nick really, not, not Horst, had something worth documenting. It was really no more than that. He'd met Nicholas, he'd, he'd had the conversation with him about carrying the picture of his father's corpse in his pocket. And Philippe's telling me this kind of thing over dinner. We're personal friends, that's how I, I came to make this movie. Um, and he's sort of going, it feels to me like maybe there's a film in this. That, I mean, this guy is simply incredible. And, you know, and I obviously agreed. And then, you know, as the film, the story that the film narrates, so by that means we become introduced to Horst and it gets richer and richer. But there's something about the uh, development of the film that is slightly obscured by the way I ended up cutting it, which is that originally Philippe was only going to be a behind the camera presence. He, you know, he really was, had effaced himself from the project. It was his enthusiasm. Actually, the enthusiasm was born out of the research that he's, he was already doing for a book, which has been his main cause for the last six years. It's being published this year by Knopf. It's called East West Street, which is a much bigger project. Um, so he's, he's mostly invested in that, and he thinks he's going to be behind the camera just asking the questions. So the, the sequences you're referring to really represent the terminus of what actually happened, which is that as we started making the film, he stopped being able to maintain his barrister's disinterested, legalistic stance towards these guys, and basically Horst started to really get under his skin. Uh, not because Horst is irritating and... Um, uh, and kind of uh, immovable, but because Horst is nice, and Philippe is really nice, and there is this bond of empathy and friendship, which is frankly what makes the film possible. But even when uh, conversations are really painful, like by the Masquerade, for example, none of the guys turn around and say, could you just stop? To me, I mean, this is awful. You know, none of them do that, because they feel kind of compelled to, to go through all of this stuff. And what I started to observe, albeit that Philippe's a friend of mine, 
when I started to observe is that you're watching this highly intelligent, unbelievably articulate man being taken to the edge of his own tether, the end of his own tether. And if I could just sum it up, the reason why I, I, I thought it was worthy of repetition is to show Philippe agonizing in a way that he couldn't predict. And it's massively, he was incredibly generous to allow me to make the film, exploiting my friendship with him to that degree. But, you know, and there are, there are colleagues of his, so a couple of senior colleagues of his, who say he's exposed himself too much as a highly, you know, as a rather important international lawyer that, you know, you don't want to be seen looking like this, you know. So there is a real risk uh, for him, which I'm so uh, grateful to him for having taken. But for me, uh, one of the most poignant just because I love Philippe, I suppose, but one of the most poignant moments of the film is when he's basically shouting at Horst, and he suddenly goes, there was a letter, I saw that, you showed me the letter that your father wrote to your mother saying, I'm going back to blah, 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 and Horst goes, yes, and Philippe goes, that's terrible evidence, <laughs> he says, as if, as if there's a judge in the room, and I, I guess, uh, what I'm, trying to, what I'm trying to indicate there as a filmmaker is like the infinitely recessive nature of justice outside a courtroom. You know, there's nobody there, Philippe. There's nobody there to, to, to kind of yeah. approve that statement. We're all, there's just a bunch of guys in an empty room. It's not going to make any difference. That's, that's why. So, I just have to say, well, we are here, obviously, and you showed that to us. And so I want to thank you first for making this very powerful film. And um, I had the privilege of meeting Philippe when he was here several years ago. Oh, were you on the email? I thing? was on oh, the okay. email, yes. <laughs> Great. Um, I'm Don Johnson. I teach right, at nice the law school, you. and, and I, um, I have worked in the Clinton administration and done some work uh, with, with Philippe around the torture. Mm -hmm. um, uh, of the Bush administration. Right. So I'm so happy to be here. Um, so Horst, I mean, what a fascinating figure. And I just want to say that when you say he's nice, I felt through, um, I, I only saw him as you presented him. I felt throughout the film that he was um, mentally ill. Um, and nice isn't a word that really came to me, but at the I did kind of feel like maybe he Philippe could convince him. You know, I did that if he could just find enough. And I'm a lawyer. I don't know. I just felt like he presented such a strong case. But the end was so horrifying. I mean, when you presented him, confronted when when people were confronting him at, or, or celebrating him as um, and, and saying his father was a decent man. And then I just found so horrifying the idea that he kind of flipped, you know, and you could see that, um, I, I don't know if it's even fair to say mental illness, if that excuses it too much, but that it seemed like you could see the potential for that kind of self-delusion, you know, to again become just, you know, horrifically yeah. violent. And, so I don't come away from the film thinking of him as nice. Uh, and anyway, did you, and what I kept wondering is, was it clear to you um, in making this where he would end up? And the fact he put himself out there and was willing to publicly talk about it and be questioned about it and confronted with all this evidence, I mean, it seemed like at times maybe he really was willing to confront the truth. Okay, so perhaps, uh, first of all, I should say that um, just calling him nice is being a bit woolly on my part. Very early on in the process of making this film, I showed some rushes, which were really only the interview elements uh, of the two guys on their own, each of them interviewed on their own. It's one of the first things that we filmed. I showed it to a group of people in a synagogue. On, um, it was actually on Holocaust Memorial Day. And I don't know exactly what I expected this group of people to say, but what I, I, it was a real penny drop moment for me because they were all absolutely, that the entire group were all much more interested in the differing psychologies of the two men than in, the, in, than in incriminating their fathers by proxy, if you see what I mean. You know, nobody's, no, we all know who's right and who's wrong. You know, there is no, I don't even get a short out of that. 
you know, I don't get a feature length movie out of that question. And so I started to think, oh, I, what, 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 what I basically mean by horse being nice is that the people in the room watching those rushes, albeit that they knew that Nicholas Frank was in the right, found his hatred of his father slightly repugnant. And that same group of people who, of course, don't have any room in their hearts to try and accommodate or understand the motivation of Otto von Wechter, the father, nevertheless could see that there's something about trying to find room to love your dad, which is empathetic. And Philippe very, very much responds to that. He, he really finds it hard to condemn Horst for his intransigence. And moreover, he can't believe that somebody as sensitive as Horst in that regard won't, as you, as you say, that, that, that if he can be that sensitive, you know, if he's as emotionally healthy in that way, surely he'll, he's going to get it somehow. And yes, I mean, that does bring up the question of Horst's mental health. Uh, in, the, in the year or so since this film was first shown at Tribeca, I've shown it to, uh, I've done lots of Q&As, and the audiences have, been, have been included fairly high proportions of professionally trained psychologists and psychiatrists. So I myself have learned an awful lot about different people's uh, take on Horst's mental health. Philippe was concerned uh, about whether Horst was going to make it through the filming. Because Horst has never tried to take a platform to defend his father. And, um, you know, he, he, uh, he was put there by us. And sure enough, when he was actually put on the spot, so he became more uh, obstinate. Uh, he, he started off, even in the Purcell room footage, mm -hmm. obviously I've seen it so often, I'm aware of these kind of nuances, Horst is a bit misty in places. Mm -hmm. Philippe goes, you know, he, he was responsible for the transportation systems that took people to their deaths. And Horst is kind of going, I, I don't know whether he was, because he hadn't found out about that. But then he made sure that he did find out. So by the end of the film, and certainly much more now, Horst is really, you know, a torchbearer for his father. We made him that way. That's, that's unfortunately mm -hmm. true. So. Um, unfortunately, the credits were cut off too soon. That's my fault. I thought you'd be good. The uh, question is, what was the sponsorship of, of the film, and by what are its prospects? Uh, it's fairly new films. I mean, you said Not you, so much. You showed me the card. Yeah, sure. that's, that's a year ago. Okay, and what has been its history of showing since then, and what is the flight rate of future distribution? Did, 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 shall I, shall I read back? Yeah. So the gentleman's saying um, who paid for it, kind of, and uh, what's happened to it since it's been released. Um, and what's likely? So we're talking about teeny weeny amounts of money just for a film crew to go to Munich and interview this guy whose father was a Nazi. That's what we were talking about. So in the very, very initial stages, Philippe was bankrolling the movie out of his own obsession. Uh, and no more than that. But very early on, uh, a guy from BBC Storyville, you maybe saw their uh, credit come up at the beginning. He uh, is, um, like with a lot of things with the BBC and perhaps with the United Kingdom more generally, he has no money, but he still has a bit of soft power. So he, um, he, uh, he, 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 he said this is, a, this is a film that ought to be made. He's the guy who greenlit Man on Wire. You know, like he, 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 he gets feature length documentaries made worldwide, this guy. And he basically said, Actually, not only did he say that we should make the movie, but he also was the first person to say, and what's more, Philippe needs to be in front of the camera and not behind it. I mean, he's, he's clever. He's, he's a very clever man. So then the BBC were on board with their teeny-weeny investment, but other people came in on the back of that. BFI, British Film Institute, got involved. Uh, and then, completely bizarrely, there's a, a, a British man who's one of the main... Uh, a very, very wealthy individual who is one of the main funders of UKIP, or the UK Independence Party, which is the party that are most vociferous about trying to get Britain out of Europe. So quite right-wing in, in, in his politics in some ways. He, 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 or he put money in. And uh, again, we're not talking about a very large amount of money that you need to make a film of this nature. So that's basically how that came about. Uh, it was shown at Tribeca. It won an award at the Israeli Film Festival. Uh, it was shown at the London Film Festival. It's going to be on UK TV in a couple of weeks, and it's going to be on PBS on May the second. Mm -hmm. Independent. Independent. Yeah, independent lens. Yeah, independent lens. Oh, okay. Sorry. 
Have you seen Martin Luther King's one, two or three films I know about him? No. So th th uh, uh, that's interesting. So th this is a movie made by the son of the Nazi envoy to Slovakia. Huh. And, and there, the, in a way, it's a little bit like this, but the division is within the same family. Okay. And so he's one of the children. There's a daughter who's holding the candle. There are others who are hoping the problem will go away. And he's, he's not the Nicholas Brandt. He's not kind of obsessed by it, but he wants to, he wants to get at the heart right. of what he's trying to do. Yeah. You, you may be interested um, that uh, Nick uh, is in a, another film called Hitler's Children, mm -hmm. made by an Israeli director, mm -hmm. uh, actually with his daughter. And although I think the film uh, you know, the film is in a way less emotionally distanced than my film. It's more emotionally engaged, the, but the sequence with uh, with Nick and his daughter is really worth watching the film for just by itself. But they have such a sweet relationship. Are there any other questions? <laughs> Hitler's Children. Hitler's Children. The other film with Nicholas Frank in it? Yeah, Hitler's Children. So? So, when, when you were making this film, you obviously spent a lot of time with these two different men who had dramatically different perspectives on how they view their father and their various responsibility with respect to the Holocaust. And I'm just wondering, based on your experiences, did you, were you able to determine which stance was more common just among children of Nazi officers in general? Is it more likely for people to, you know, condemn their, their parents or grandparents, or are people more inclined to defend them? I guess this is the thing that makes my film, not by dint of my original purpose, by the way, but I think this is the thing that makes our film unique in what is, after all, a subgenre of documentary, the Holocaust documentary. Namely, that there, has, there haven't been any other films made with anybody quite like Horst, i.e. somebody who avows the, 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 uh, the status and the position of their father, who's not a Holocaust denier, who's not a nutcase, pure and simple, um, <laughs> who nevertheless says what he says. And uh, it's more or less been accepted by Q&As, you know, in, in German-speaking countries, for example. It's been shown in Hamburg, it's been shown in Vienna. That was quite a screening. Um, th that is probably the, the more prevalent position, and more so in Austria than Germany. Because obviously, Otto von Becht is Austrian, Horst is Austrian, Nick is German. There's, a, there's, a, there's quite a big cultural difference when it comes to matters like these. Uh, when Philippe, I wasn't at the Vienna screening myself, but when Philippe went to the Vienna screening, somebody asked him, uh, as a Jew, how do you feel about being here, you know, in the German-speaking world now? And Philippe's response was that he felt very comfortable in Germany, but not so much in Austria. And there was a little bit of a backlash from the audience, um, and the people of my generation and older were saying, you've got it wrong since the 1970s, we maybe were a bit late to come to this necessary process of working our way through this material, but now we have. And then the younger generation stood up and challenged their own parents, as it were, and said, one, one young woman said that her grandfather had recently died, and that and since his death she'd found out that he had participated in the construction of the death camp. So really no room for disavowal there, but because there's this sort of secrecy, there's this, this taboo about discussing it, She'd never, she would never have that conversation with him now because he died. So uh, that, that sense of it was all terribly tragic and life was so cheap, but people can avoid personal, taking personal responsibility. I think in the main, to varying degrees, that's quite prevalent. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? So what happened at the end uh, between these two men? There was a little bit of discussion of Philippe asking whether he was... <sighs> I, 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 th I think the truth is we've kind of, as a group, we've slightly run out of mutual goodwill. <laughs> Certainly, if I'd been having this session with you a couple of months ago, I would have a slightly different, more benevolent attitude towards Horst than I do now. <laughs> and to me, a lot, that's in large part because we were invited by the museum <laughs> that now curates the courtroom at Nuremberg to show this film in courtroom 600 at Nuremberg. Um, and Horst and Nick, who are no longer friends, both agreed to come. And Philippe and I were both there as well. And that's the only time that we've all four of us sat on the stage and had a Q&A that was conducted in the German language. 
So I was sitting there with headphones on, rather as if I was a <laughs> British delegate at the Nuremberg trials, listening to the, somebody translate, desperately trying to keep up to the translation of what they were saying. And perhaps because they were talking to each other in their own language, there's a lot of antipathy now. A horse is completely immovable. They're, they're enemies, really. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not worked out well. And I don't really... I'm saying Horst is nice. I'm sort of feeling less like that now than I used to. <laughs>